Oh, we should have said Pastor. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Westview Christian Center. We're glad you're all here. It's so wonderful to see you, and we have missed you all. And so let's uh, get in here and let's start with a word of prayer. So Dave has just figured something out, so we'll start here in a moment. Okay, I can go ahead now. Thank you, Dave. Uh, this is kind of a new thing for us in that we're doing live stream as well as people here present. And so we want to be able to rejoice in multiple places all the time. So if you're here, if you would stand with me, please, and we'll open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the great grace that you have shown towards us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for preserving us during this time of crisis and we thank you for giving us peace. And so Father, as we worship and sing today, we know that you hear our praises and that our praises are a delight to you. Yes. And so Father, as we focus on this today, on this great gathering, first time back in a month or so, yes. we just want to make it a special occasion for you. And so, Father, we're giving you all the glory, all the praise, yes. and we're doing everything in Jesus' yes. name. Let's sing. Amen. Are we ready to sing?
his fullness and in his grace towards us. So as we look at this today, I want to read once again, but I'm going to read out of the book of Luke, and I'm going to read from Luke 22, and this is an important thing, and it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so for I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. What's he talking about? He's talking about the last Passover, and he, as the perfect lamb, is going to be the one that is going to be sacrificed that will make the final and permanent atonement for all of us. The lambs that were sacrificed at every other time were only good for one year. And so this time it's going to be forever and by faith we can believe in him and watch as we experience the new life. So after the taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this cup, divide it among you. For I tell you, I'm not going to drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. We know that the rule and the reign of God has come. And so we can celebrate that because that's what brings us together is the rule and reign of the kingdom of God in our hearts, in our lives, among our friends, in our community, in our state, and in our world. It's very important for us to understand that we are the primary witnesses of what Jesus did, and that's what we need to tell everybody. So let's take it this time. These little things can be tricky, and so you just need to pull the ceram up. You've done it a couple of times, so you can do it now. Static electricity is your enemy. <laughs> so we have here this little wafer which represents the bread and it's a symbol. And so remembering that it was his body that was broken for us, let's partake. Now, we're going to talk today in the message about when he changed water into wine. This is grape juice, but what we're going to do is we're going to understand that him changing the water into wine was the inauguration of the new covenant that he's talking about here. He says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. There are no more covenants after this. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out from you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Jesus operates in reality. Jesus does not operate in fantasy and say, oh, I wish everybody liked me. He knows what's going on. And so they began to question themselves, hey, was it me or whatever? But let's partake of the cup now, thinking that we know who gave us the new covenant. You may now partake. Why don't you stand with us and we'll pray. <clears throat> Father, it's only by your grace that we can get together, that we can love each other and manifest your love to others as well. And so as we do that today, we're reminded constantly of the sacrifice that you made for us. We're constantly reminded of the new life that we have as new creations in you through faith. Yes. And so, Father, as we gather now to meet and to greet, we just pray that you would be with us as we extend the joyful embrace of Christian fellowship to one another. Yes. And so, Father, bless us during this day and through this week to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, the moment you've been all waiting for, you can now circulate around and meet oh, and greet. Oh, get to it? Oh. Oh, I'm There's an extra. Do you have plenty of those at home? In case you need them for anything? 
no. Are, are we doing another full session? No, 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 no. I just want to. Oh, I have one. Oh, okay. Hey. Yeah. How do you do it? It's four. No, okay. Welcome. If you, if you need to take some, let me show you. you here. Here. Robert and your mom. You could do that. It's We're glad to have you. I mean, then I'll, then I'll just do two more. Okay. Okay. That'll do it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Well, we're nice to everybody. I don't know where you've been, but we're nice to everybody. Sorry you've had those experiences. Sorry, sorry you've had those experiences, but uh, not us. We even lived ten years in Mobile, Alabama. So. Oh man. So. Don't so, talk about Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, I know. In Montgomery. Yes. Oh man. I oh, didn't like Alabama. Montgomery, and I didn't like Ooh, Birmingham. Man, rough, so. rough territory. I know that is rough territory. Yes, I had some great friends that were uh, were African American, mm -hmm. and I, I worked in big construction, and I had a lot of my foremen and a lot of my superintendents were African American. And it didn't make any difference to me what color they were. I went on this one. Okay. I'm an old man stuck in this way. Okay. My father always used to say, "You're an old man." No, don't worry about it. Don't worry. We'll see it after the service is over. We do. We do gifts.
what we call meet and greet. We do this every Sunday here, and you can do it at home wherever you are. And uh, we just enjoy seeing one another and encouraging one another. And we have not been together like this in about six weeks, so this is a good time for us to be together. So I'm going to ask uh, some, a couple of ushers at this time, if they would, to come and uh, get ready to receive an offer. Robert, could you do that? Yes, sir. I'll and Steve, it. could you do that? Could you help Robert? Or James, James, are you already out? I'm getting up. Okay, stay seated, Steve. Okay. All right. Chill, Steve. Chill out. <laughs> yeah, chill out, Steve. Yeah, you're usually so uptight. Yeah, you're so, always so uptight. <laughs> Never laugh. <laughs> uh, let me just do a couple of announcements, and uh, then we'll go on from there. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity to be online live streaming, and we're doing that now. And so we just want to say hello to all of those in other areas. And so we want to thank all of you during the time that we did not have uh, public gatherings that, uh, oh, Steve's going to do it after all. Cool. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Easy. Yes, Easy, Steve. Steve. Um, <laughs> we want to thank you for your faithfulness and generosity in giving. And of course, you can do it on the website, Venmo. You can uh, drop it in the mail at P.O. Box 734. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. So. We just want to thank you for the way that you've been generous and faithful. It helps us out a lot. So let's pray now and ask God to multiply and bless these offerings that are given today. And so, Father, we just want to thank you for the way that you provide for us, the way that you uh, sustain us, and the way that you keep us in, in every way. And so, Father, we're asking that you would bless these offerings as they're given today so that we can multiply the good news of your kingdom's coming. And so we thank you now and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can do it, Steve. You, you too, Robert. <clears throat> As you can see, first day back, we're pretty formal. Um, we're going to be uh, doing the dual type of service from here on. Um, and so we'll be doing live stream from here on. Uh, the reason that you couldn't watch us sing is because of copyright rules and copyright restrictions. So we haven't figured out how, as we project YouTube here, that we could project the projected YouTube right out to you at uh, their live stream. And so we'll have to work on that, but YouTube is a little bit restrictive. And so we'll just be doing it uh, right here with us. Uh, if we had children with us today, we'd be sending them out, but we do not have children. And so we'll do that again next week. And so hopefully we'll have some kids. So what I want to do today is I want to have Emma come up. And Emma, would you please come up and lead us in prayer for the nation and get us up to speed on some things? Yes. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, we usually pray for the nation. And uh, as we all know, the nation is in a mess right now. But I am really encouraged because... I can see that uh, God is exposing some of the evil that has been going on, and people are being come to uh, come brought to account. And I do know that's because the people of God have been praying. So, and we need to keep praying. And that has been one of the reasons we are in this mess is we have not been praying. We have been uh, slack in our walk with the Lord as American Christians because we're spoiled quite honestly yeah. but um, I do want to remind you also to please pray against the spirit of abortion the spirit of death every day if, as you get a chance just it doesn't have to be like a long drawn out remember just let the heart of God move you in compassion father please please <clears throat> eradicate that awful, awful abortion in our nation. Yeah. So, it's, you know, God doesn't require flowery language. He just re requires a submitted heart, a submitted heart, uh, humbling ourselves and coming to him. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> <clears throat> Father, we acknowledge that you are God and that there is none like you. And that you are indeed always at work, even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't see it. That you are the way maker. There are many people in our nation who need to know Jesus Christ. 
Father, that is why part of the reason our country's in such a mess, so many people in our nation and in our government are far from you. They don't have peace. They don't have joy. Oh God, we pray for them. We pray for a great awakening, especially in our capital. Those that have formerly been filled with their own selves and their own desires would, would bow the knee and acknowledge you now, not uh, in eternity, but now that Jesus Christ is Lord and come into a saving uh, relationship with Jesus. Father, we pray that you would continue. We call out to you to continue exposing wickedness in high places. We pray that you would protect our president and the godly men that are there. And I pray especially in this time of uh, the pandemic that is, seems to be so overblown in fear, that, Father, that peace would begin to settle over uh, our nation. I think of the song that we sang, that your face would turn toward us, it would shine upon us. You would give our nation peace. We, that we would be peacemakers as we go out, that we would be able to speak <clears throat> faith and peace to those that are afraid. Father, that we would change the atmosphere in our city, in our state, and in our nation. We are your children. Father, we're calling out. We want to be like Jesus. We want to make a difference in this nation. And we know that that's your desire also, that your people who are called by your name would indeed act like Jesus, pray like Jesus, speak like Jesus, because we are your ambassadors. So we pray for the church in America to be the church of Jesus Christ in strength and power, even now. And we bless your name and thank you for all that you already are doing. We thank you for healing and deliverance. We thank you for salvation and restoration. We thank you for sanctification. So many things you do in our lives. And we thank you that yours is the power and the glory forever and ever. And there is no God like you. We bless your name in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Emma. We always want to continue to pray for our nation because it's a very important thing for us to do. Brother, would you come up here, please? We have a brother that came uh, to our city, and he's from Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, he's a pastor there, and so would you greet the people? First, giving honor to God, to the pastor, to this church. I walked in here this morning needing the pastor's help, but I didn't know I was going to meet all these cheerful people inside of God's house. We only have cheerful people. That's right. We are blessed. Yeah, you gave me a good welcome, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. And especially where that lady at that made the coffee? Oh, where's Sharon. You, Sharon. Sharon, where's she at? Sharon. She back there. Yeah. She gets, Sharon gets on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something. It's a blessing for me to be here this morning. I uh, ran into some problems along the way on the highway, and I took it up with the pastor. Um, I'm going to leave it right there with him. But we were on our way to my mother's funeral, blew an engine on the car. But we bought another car. We maxed out the credit cards and bought another car to make it over there and back home. And it just so happened, God was speaking to me this morning. I'm going to tell you where I spent the night at. Same place I bought the car, St. George. <laughs> but I got up this morning, about 8.30 this morning, and I prayed, and my wife prayed before I did, because she always pray over me when I'm asleep. I done told you about doing that. Because every time she prayed, something happened to me. But anyway, she prayed over me this morning, and I got up this morning, and I said, she said, where are we going? I said, wherever God take us. We got up this morning, got here to town. Something told me to take this road and come down. When I came down the road, here your church was. Really? So I came in, and there was a red truck here, which I can't remember your name Sharon. again. See, I'm getting old. I can't remember things <laughs> like I used to. But anyway, 
they were here this morning and she offered me a cup of coffee. But the, only, the best thing she offered me was me to come in and sit down and hear the word. Amen. Amen. That was God talking this morning. No matter what you're going through and you think it's happened to you, God is still in control. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Amen. Amen. No man cometh to the Father <clears throat> but by me. Amen. Now, it, don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't want to stand here long because I'll be unpreached. <laughs> but you know, it's point. very hard to come in a place and see in some churches that the pastor is loving and kind as Mr. Jerry was. Amen. Like I said, I'm not trying to butt him up. He's just real. <laughs> yes, he is. Okay? And I didn't know that he was 75 years old. <laughs> I thought I was 64. I was just about as old as he was. And then somebody told me, I said, wait a minute. He's between 75 and 80? And he said, yeah. I said, well, he's one of the old-time preachers. That's what you need in this church. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. They got some new chief, uh, new preachers coming out. It's going to be pretty good. And some of them are going to be okay. <clears throat> but it ain't nothing like that old-time preacher. Yeah. Okay? He didn't need a diploma on the wall to say who he is. That's right. God already said who he is. Amen. He sent him. That's right. See, you got these preachers sometimes come out of college and after seminar. Well, I got this diploma, and I do. Well, where's the diploma that God gave me? You see, you can't see that on the wall, but you can see it in the heart and in the mind. And he's one of those old time preachers that I like. See, I love them old time preachers, backwood preachers, because they're preaching what God intended for them to preach. You'll see him come up, he might use a few pieces of paper, but I believe in my heart, <clears throat> when he started looking from this paper, he forgets about this paper, and he goes to where the Bible said, let it flow from you like living waters. Amen. Amen. See, if you got this paper, you got a paper sermon. If you got a computer, you got a computer sermon. But God said, let it flow from you like living waters. Amen. Pastor, I'm gonna get away from up here before I be done preaching. <laughs> why don't you stand? Why don't you stand with me? Why don't you stand with me? And if some of you want to come up and lay hands on the brother and lay hands on the sister right there, then let's do that. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Why? Because <laughs> if I get to talking, I get to preach. I know. <laughs> right. right. But I'm, even though I'm old, I'm strong. I'll push you out of the way. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we just come this morning and we thank you for those that come as a surprise. And so, Father, we thank you for the blessed surprise of this brother who follows you, serves you, and his wife who does the same. And so we ask that you would bless them as we bless them as they go on their way from here. And so, Father, we're just asking for your blessing to be upon them. Let your presence go with them just as the cloud went yes. with the children of yes. Israel, yes. the Amen. pillar of fire by yes. night and the cloud by day until they came to their next resting place. And so, Father, we're asking this now for these brothers and sisters, and we're asking it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, Amen. 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 Amen my brother. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. I told you I got to get away from up here. I know. We know how pastors are. Okay, we're here today. Thank you, my brother. When I told him I had spent some time in Mobile, Alabama, he apologized. He said, I'm sorry. But uh, we had a great time down. Did you down. tell him about Pascagoula? No, I didn't tell him about Pascagoula. We lived in Pascagoula, Mississippi, too. Oh, man. So, yeah. so, so he said that was really bad. I lived in Clarksville, Tennessee. Oh, man, you're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know where Clarksville is. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about one of the episodes from the Chosen miniseries, and I love this one, and it's about where Jesus changes the water into wine. But this is a special day, and it ties in with Mother's Day, because Jesus' mother asked him to do something about the lack of wine. 
and like a good obedient boy he did it and so mothers don't be asking your kids for impossible tasks and so we need to understand what all went on in that day but i'm i'm excited too <clears throat> because we are gathering together and we haven't been able to do it for a while and so i thought of a couple of songs and so the first one that i thought of was a christian song an old hymn called blessed be the tie that binds blessed be the tie that binds our heart in christian love the fellowship our spirit finds is like to that above Amen. before our father's throne we pour out our ardent prayers our fears our hopes our sins are gone our comforts and our cares he gives so that's a good one but then being somewhat of a fan of country music i also thought of a, a tune by the bard of bakersfield buck owens and it was together again and so <clears throat> Here we go. Together again. You know, how's that? But biblically, if I go back, the thing that we want to reflect on is Psalm 133. It says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in Amen. unity. Amen. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And I think whenever we get together, we get to experience that same sense of Amen. unity and love that the psalmist David is talking about in that one there. But to go to the text today, it's going to be out of John chapter 2, and we're going to talk about uh, what is John's purpose? To be able to understand this passage, because we have been in some of the other Gospels with some of the other instances of God's actions, we, we need to understand that John takes a little bit different twist. <clears throat> so John has a distinct purpose in what he conveys. And so that's important for us because we'll see it as we go through this particular passage. So John has this purpose. And, it say, and he says in chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, he says, Jesus performed many other signs. Now, John uses the word signs and not the word miracles because signs are indicative of what's to come. A miracle may be a one-time one -time event, but a sign foretells something that's coming down. So what is John using as a sign? What John is using as a sign is a multiple number of things, and we'll look at that in a moment. But we need to understand that John has a purpose. Matthew had a purpose. He wanted to give an account to all of the Jews so that they would believe in him. Luke had an account, and he wanted to make sure that everything was correct because he was a doctor. Mark has an account, and so what he's writing down is his mentor, Peter, He's writing down Peter's experiences for us. And so if you have anybody that's new to the Bible, have them read Mark. I mean, it's like a Marvel comic in a way because it's active. It's pow, Jesus did this, Jesus did this, Jesus did this. But John is different. John is pointing to something. He's saying that, but these things are written that you may believe right. that Jesus is the Messiah, the that's Son right. of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So that's John chapter 20. That's the purpose. Okay, so now what, what are some of the signs? Are there many signs? So we have a list of signs here for you. And so first of all, John uh, down the way is going to heal a paralyzed person. He's going to feed a crowd of 5,000. He's going to walk on water. He's going to heal a blind man. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's going to wash the disciples' feet. That's a sign. And then finally today, we're going to look at changing water into wine. And it's very important for us to understand that this is all looking forward to Jesus the Messiah. So what I want to do is I'm going to read the passage to you <clears throat> out of John chapter 2. And I want you to take a look at these uh, images here because these images are very important to understand what's going on. Now, some people, they say, uh, well, he, he probably had some residue in one of the stone pots, 
and he just poured water in there. The answer is there'd be no residue in the stone pots, which may have looked like these stone pots right here. And they were carved out of limestone, and why did they use stone pots? That's important to the story. Uh, the reason that they used stone pots is that the water would be ritually pure. You see, clay pots would go ahead and clay pots would be able to hold uh, water, but they would also hold residue. <clears throat> and so ritual washing would uh, ritual washing would mean that these were always clean. And so this is what Jews used to use to wash themselves at the prescribed times for different ceremonies. Now here is a picture of a man pouring water into one of these huge storm stone jars. And by the way, in a number within the last decade, they have found numbers of these stone jars in the place where they made them. So it's a real thing. So let me read this to you and you 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 can just gaze upon that. It says the next day there was this wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Now where is Cana? Well, Cana is about eight miles northwest or northeast, I'm sorry, of Nazareth. That's where Jesus was born. That's where Jesus grew up. So this is a pretty important thing because everybody was pretty interrelated. Uh, then some of the people there must have known Jesus' mother and they invited him and they invited Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters to come to the wedding. Wedding feasts were really a big deal. That was one of the big primary things, one of the primary events other than the religious feasts. That was the primary events that went on in Jewish life. And so there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now it wasn't all 12 of them at that time. They were they were getting ready to they were getting ready to host a number of uh, disciples, but there were some more disciples that that were going to be called. So they're there at the party and these things went on for about seven days. So this was a long party. And so while they were there, the wine supply ran out during the festivities. And so that's a bad deal at a, at a thing like this because in a culture where shame is freely given and sometimes turned hostile, the fact that the bridegroom ran out of wine is a big deal. And maybe Mary, the mother of Jesus, might have suffered some embarrassment because she was a friend of the bridegroom and the, and the bride and their, and their parents. So the wine supply runs out. So Jesus' mother says they have no more wine. So Jesus says, dear woman, that's not our problem. That was not a snark. He called people woman. Even at the cross, he says to Mary and Mary Magdalene, he says, woman, and he says to his mother, he says, woman, behold thy son. And he's pointing to John. And he says to John, he says, son, behold your mother. And so it's not a hostile term like we would go, woman. In that culture, they would say, woman. And they would say it in a delicate way. I can't see Jesus saying a harsh word unless no. you're a Pharisee. No. Can you? No. I mean, look at how he accepts us. Okay. So he says, that's not our problem, Mom. My time has not yet come. In other words, the fullness of the hour for me to manifest my glory, that's what John is pointing towards. And he says, my time has not yet come. And he's thinking of the other things down the line. And Mary, who has pondered all of these things in her heart, remembers and knows. So she turns in full faith to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. I think that takes a lot of faith, don't you? I mean, here Jesus has said, hey, not, not my time. And she turns to him and says, do whatever he tells you to do. So what a compassionate Savior we have because he turns and, and he says to these guys, he says that standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And so what that does is that takes up a lot of space. 
So Jesus tells the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars have been filled, he said, now, dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So we're going from having water, fresh water, put into Jewish ceremonial washing uh, stone pots. And so they're just dipping it out. There's no hocus pocus, no anything else. They're just dipping it out and they're taking it to the master of the banquet. And the master of the banquet is tasting the water that was now wine and not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew. He said, he called the bridegroom over. He said, a host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink and dull their taste buds, he brings out the less expensive stuff. But you have kept the best until now. So this miraculous sign at Gehenna in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. See, the disciples' belief didn't come instantaneously. Yes, they followed, but the thorough, long-lasting belief that would tide them through all of the things to come was just now growing in faith in them. Haven't you found that to be true? Is that whenever you first connect with Jesus, you just start and you experience a little bit, a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And then as you go along, you begin to grow and to know what is going on. As you watch Jesus and the disciples from here on, you're going to watch them as they continue to grow in their belief in him and they get closer and closer to him. That's why we need to connect with Jesus. Now, changing water into wine is kind of a popular statement because you go places and people say, oh, what do you want me to do, change the water into wine? And um, going back to country music, uh, I was shocked this one time to hear one by T. Graham Brown, and it's talking about a guy who's in the throes of alcoholism, and he said, uh, you've heard a multitude of prayers on my behalf, I pray one more is not too much to ask. I've tried to fight this battle by myself, but it's a war that I can't win without your help, talking to God. Tonight, I'm as low as any man can go. I'm down and I can't fall much farther. And once upon a time, you turned water into wine. Now on my knees, I'm turning to you, Father. Can you help me turn the wine back into water? Is that, is that a statement? You see, it's sometimes what we need to have happen is we need to have Jesus take stuff away. Other times we just need to turn to him and figuratively, figuratively go through that. So in Jewish life, we need to talk about some of the things that are going on at this time. Otherwise, this just seems like, oh, yeah, that, that was neat. You know, that he changed water into wine, uh, saved him from a catering disaster. No, that's not what goes on. What goes on is we have a wedding feast. Every wedding feast in Jewish life looked forward to the ultimate wedding feast of God and his people. Amen. It was always about a wedding feast. It was always about a wedding. It was always about marriage. It was about covenant. It was about linking together. God always made covenants with Israel, and they would always break them. And you have to abide by the provisions of the covenant to receive the blessings of the covenant. And so every time that they had a wedding feast, which lasted seven days, then they would be rejoicing that here another covenant was made, and we are excited about watching this picture of God and his people. So we're also looking at this from the standpoint of three days. It was after three days. See, in Jewish life, three days is always indicative of important things. You see, Jesus rose on the third day, but this is before that even. We know that in three days, there were things that happened in creation that otherwise could not have happened. Also, too, the number three or three occurrences is important for Jews because if it happened once, it could be a coincidence. If it happened twice, it might be somebody's planning. But for something to happen three days in a row or three occasions, of the same thing, it had to be God acting. So they're always looking at these numbers of occasions. It's significant. And so for us, John is looking back at his time with Jesus, and he's indicating the redemptive significance of the resurrection and the perfection of God's work in creation. So whenever we look at it, 
we are looking at things through Western eyes that we need to change and look through Israel's first century eyes. Also, too, here we see Jesus. And Jesus is not just a traveling rabbi. John is heralding Jesus as the one who fulfills the old covenant and brings in the new covenant. That's why whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I always say that the new covenant was the last covenant ever to be made and the longest lasting one. There is no covenant after that. There is no covenant after that. You don't need one after that. Right. Once you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. That's right. And all you need That's to do right. is believe by faith. That's, right. That's what it's all about. So here we see wine, and wine is always in Israel's history. It's always been ceremonial, connected with blood and sacrifice, and an indicator of new life. Actually, on some Israeli coins of that period, it's indicated by there being a grapevine with a few grapes on it. And so Jesus even has uh, uh, called them the vine. God calls them the vine. The vine came out of Egypt. You know, it's just all of these things, and it, it's indicative of his, who his people are. Running out of wine was a big embarrassment, a big no-no. And so if Jesus' mother Mary knew the couple that was getting married and also knew the parents of them, then she was not going to want to suffer that kind of embarrassment in that day and time. Uh, if you don't think embarrassment and shame were tools of the day, remember whenever Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth and he preached from Isaiah and he said, in this, in your hearing, these scriptures have been fulfilled. And they all went out to Denny's afterwards and celebrated that he was the coming Messiah, right? Yeah. Wrong. What did they do? They took him out. They were going to stone him. So these people were pretty stuck in who they were and what was going on. Now, the stone jars, we already talked about that. <clears throat> they are ceremonially pure. For them, ritual purification or ceremonial purification was very important. If you doubt that, read the book of Numbers, read the book of Leviticus, and you will find out how important ritual purification was to maintain. And so it's very very different than what we experience today. Today we have health codes. Today we do all kinds of things that we think we don't need God. And uh, in reality, we need God even more than yeah. they did. Okay, so his mother and his brothers. Now Jesus' mother and his brothers are there. And in Matthew chapter 11, you can read about when Jesus and his mother and his brothers are referred to, and they're saying about Jesus, hey, <laughs> isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know him? We know his mother. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. And so we watch as until the resurrection, then they remain somewhat skeptical. They even think Jesus is crazy at one point, and they go back and they understand that he truly is the son of God, and they begin to believe. And actually, his half-brother uh, James, not you, James, James, actually becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. So that represents a distinct turnabout in the belief system. So what kind of things can we glean from this passage? Well, I think there are some important things for us to do, to look at. First of all, your social status doesn't matter if you know Jesus Christ. Amen. If you know Jesus Christ, your ethnicity, your social status, your financial wherewithal, None of it really matters. Somebody once said, oh, in heaven they pave the streets of gold. And we go, yeah, dirt. <laughs> and so we realize that in our life, social status, or even where you're at on the org chart at work, doesn't really matter. You see, if you know Jesus Christ, your position on the hierarchy at your place of employment really doesn't matter. Because you may be there as an ambassador in Christ to that particular organization, and you have all of the wisdom of God, you have the love of Jesus Christ, and so you have the insights in being able to function in that way. Now, sometimes you can't really function because people above you don't really like it. They think you're trying to show them up. But really what you're trying to do is out of love, you're trying to show them not only a better way, but also a way that's bounded with love. And it can be really tough. And so I've told my kids, I said, it doesn't matter where you're at on the org chart. And I'm telling you, 
it doesn't matter where you're at on the org chart because you are an ambassador for Jesus Amen. Christ, right. no matter if you're at the bottom, the middle, or the top. That's right. That's right. And so it's something that we need to understand. And so here, they're at a wedding, and so here's the son of glory right there. And so his mother comes to him and says, they're out of wine. He does not say, don't talk to me like that, Mom. I'm all grown up now. I've been out in the wilderness for 40 days. I know how to handle this stuff. So what he says, and he doesn't, says, doesn't say, I've already cleaned my room. What he says is, he says, woman, it's not my time. I'm on God's timetable. And then he's quiet. That's all. But she says, knowing who full well who he is, she says to the servants, she says, do what he tells you. And so that opens up the gateway. So Jesus says, oh, all of those pots over there? Fill them with water, all the way to the brim. And then he watches as it takes place. So what we're looking at here is we are looking at the relationship that has changed between the mother and the son. You see, a lot of times whenever we get saved and our kids get saved, what happens is, is our relationship changes from one, yes, mom, I'll do whatever you say. It changes from mother to son, father to son, father to daughter. It changes to fellow believer. In other words, then, like my father is now my brother in Christ. My mother was my sister in Christ. And so the whole relationship changes. It's just not based on birth order or anything else. It's based on where you are in God's family or out of God's family. Now, that doesn't get rid of the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that your Lord, your God, gives you. It doesn't change that at all. I still have to honor my father and mother. But what happens is, is on a unique spiritual level, I have a relationship with them that is at a different level than I ever had before. Because even now at my age, which uh, the brother referred to, and uh, I don't mind the number, 76, um, whenever I look at age 76, my father who's in his 90s is still my father, but he's also my brother. So it's just kind of one of those neat things that happens. And so if your father is a believer too, then he's my brother. And we didn't even have the same, same mother. We may have eaten lunch at the same time, 12 noon, but he is not, but he is not my father. He's your father, but he's my brother. So there's a whole new level of relationships that we come. And so one of the things that we, we look at here in this story is that an earthly bridegroom could only furnish inferior wine. Anything that the master furnishes would be far superior to Amen. anything else. But now we know that from the picture in Scripture that the heavenly bridegroom has now appeared and provides abundant goodness and grace. God loves us so much that it's incredible for us to fathom it. And so what we do is we fail to share that much love with others. You see, that's why the, first, the two great commandments are there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second like unto it is, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. In other words, we all love ourselves. Even now with smartphones, we take selfies. How about taking othersies and start doing that? Take pictures of other people so that you can remember them and understand how great they are. So what Jesus does in this case is he reveals the salvation, the abundance, and the new life that we have by believing in him. The disciples are now fully connected at a spiritual level as well as at a natural level with Jesus Christ. And that's where we want to be. So see, we need to gain from John's account. We need to understand that there is a connecting that needs to take place, that no matter with anything else, that we need to see some things happen. So when we connect with Jesus, what do we get? 
Baptized in lemon juice? No. Christians who are sour and hostile, are they even saved? Are they even transformed? Or maybe they just a court low on grace. I don't know, but it, I, I marvel at seeing those kind of things happen. How do they do that? How do they walk with Jesus Christ and be all depressed and downcast and despaired all the time? How does that happen? If it's chemical, fine, we can fix that. If it's attitude-wise, why are you doing that? So you see, we've got joy and celebration. We need to understand that just as Jesus watched over the reputation of his mother and the reputation of this unknown bride and girl, we need to realize that God watches over us and cares about us in every detail of our life. Amen. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth, searching those to whom he can exercise his grace upon. You see, God is always watching. He's always watching for a reason. And so we know, too, that he cares about people. I mean, here he is. He was invited to this wedding banquet. Would they have let him in if he just shows up? Maybe, maybe not. Would have been their loss, wouldn't it? So we need to understand that he not only is involved in our lives, but cares about our lives. And we have the assurance that he provides and not just the necessities. You see, he could have let the bridegroom and the bride go ahead and suffer the embarrassment of not having wine, but he cared about them because his mother cared about them and because it's the basic nature of God himself. Amen. And so he provides more than the necessity. I mean, we ride around in automobiles. Some of them are necessities. Some of them are extras. We ride around in all kinds of things, and we need to understand that our God provides those in ways that we could not otherwise know. So we also watch as we get to see the Creator in action. I mean, I would have loved to have been there and watched the, watch the expression on the master of the banquet's face. By the way, if you haven't seen it, uh, you can go to The Chosen uh, on YouTube and you can go to episode five and you can see this episode on there in The Chosen. And you can see when, where the host of the banquet actually gets up and exults in what God has done. I mean, it's incredible. It's good to watch. Uh, you also know that we now get to witness God's great love. You see, before it was all rules and regulations, do this, do that. Now it's not only we get to do that, we don't have to do that, but we get to do that. But now we get to, by faith, result in Jesus Christ. We get to res resolve our lives in him and find everything that we need. And then finally, we get to receive the best gifts of all. We get eternal life. I mean, and all it takes is a change of your heart, your attitude. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in you, and we receive the best gifts of all. It's not just new wine. It's everlasting joy. Amen. It's a right relationship with yes. God himself, yes. and it's true peace. Amen? Amen. 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 Change the wine back into water. No, leave it like it is. We'll, we'll deal with it. I would rather have the new wine that comes from the Holy Spirit Amen. to bring out. Yes. So let's stand, if you will, and we'll pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we're coming today as we've looked at this particular miracle, which we thought was only a miracle, but it's actually a sign of the reign and the kingship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as he ruled over creation that day, and as he exercised his compassion and love to those at that wedding feast, we thank you for being involved in our lives. And Father, we want to connect with Jesus and connect with you so that we can experience the full life that you have for us. And so we're giving ourselves to you now. We're celebrating your goodness and your grace, and we're sharing it with everybody that we come in contact with. And we're doing it now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. We have a small reception in the other room for mothers. So if you're not a mother, stay away. No. Oh. <laughs> that didn't go over very good. No.